This is a review over the money multiplier. So the money multiplier goes with the monetary policy unit, but it specifically looks at how banking works and how when banks give out loans, it ends up creating money out of thin air. And so there are a lot of parts that go with the money multiplier, and I'm going to summarize it by giving you an example of each of the types of money multiplier problems and using these rules and how College Board asks questions on it to help you understand how they work. So the first type of problem you see in a money multiplier problem is known as a demand deposit problem. This is really common. It happens all the time. It's just consumers putting their money into their banking account. So that is what a demand deposit is. It's just a checking account, people putting their money into their bank. So let's say that I put $5,000 into my banking account. This goes into the demand deposits of the bank. And note that demand deposits are a liability for the bank because this bank has to give me that money whenever I want to use it to buy things. So it's always a debt the bank owes to the people who put it in there. But the money doesn't just sit idly in a bank's demand deposits. What they end up doing is taking out the required reserves, which that's the percentage banks have to keep in the vault. So let's say in this scenario, the required reserve is 20%. Which means this bank has to keep 1,000 just sitting idly in the vault untouched. But that still leaves 4,000 left over and that will end up going into a bank's excess reserves. This is the money left over. This is the money the bank has the power to manipulate. And a bank operates like a business to make profit. And how they make profit is by charging interest on loans given out from money in their excess reserves. So what ends up happening with money that's in a bank's excess reserves is they a lot of times loan it out. And what happens is if this bank gives out a loan of this $4,000, to anyone, a business, a consumer, to anyone, now that money is in two places at the same time. It's in my account for me to use whenever I want to withdraw it to pay for things. But it also is in whoever the loan is giving to's account for whenever they want to use it. So that poof creates money out of thin air because the money now is in two places at once. So when a bank gives out a loan, that is what changes the money supply. So what would happen with this demand deposit problem is my money could trickle down from bank to bank to bank to bank till it decreases to zero. And it decreases based on taking the required reserve out over and over and over again. And every time it does that, it creates money. And what the money multiplier formula does is shows if my money goes from bank to bank to bank to bank till it trickles all the way down to zero, how much could the money supply potentially change by? So instead of having to add it all up and calculating from bank to bank, we have the money multiplier formula. It's one over the required reserves, but you put it in decimal format. So in this case, the money multiplier formula would be one over 0.2 because of the 20% required reserves, which equals five. Now you can't use a calculator on the AP exam. So they're not gonna give you super complicated reserve requirements because they need you to be able to do the math in your head pretty quickly. And in fact, they usually only give you four different scenarios in terms of reserve requirement. 10%, which one over 0.1, the multiplier would be 10. 20%, as I did here, one over 0.2, the multiplier would be five. 25%, one over 0.25, the multiplier would be four or 50%, one over 0.5, so the multiplier would be two. So they're only gonna give you ones that you can, most people can solve in their heads. So what you're gonna do is times this multiplier by the excess reserves. So I'm gonna times the 4,000 by five, and that's gonna give me what's known as my new demand deposits. New demand deposits are the same thing as loans. It's just all the loans given from bank to bank to bank to bank added up together to get that number. So it saves you from having to do a lot more math. So if it ever asks for the maximum change in loans, it would just be NDD because that is the total of all the loans added up together. So AP questions on this demand deposit problem. The first one's very important and asks a lot. Did the money supply initially change? Well, it was my money before. I didn't create money by putting it in the bank. All that happened is that now it's in the banking system, so no. In a demand deposit problem, the money supply does not initially change. Second question, how much can this bank initially lend out? In every problem I'm gonna go over today, 
that's always just ER. That's how much a bank has to lend out because that's how much they have after taking out required reserves. So in this scenario, this bank has $4,000 that it can initially lend out. Third question is how much could the money supply potentially increase by? So this is looking at how much money could be created because of my deposit. So nothing was created initially because that money existed in the money supply before. But the 20,000 created from loans from bank to bank to bank to bank does represent new money. So $20,000 is the amount the money supply could potentially increase by. And the final question, you notice that there's a lot of ways to say it. And keep in mind all of those ways. It could be total change in reserves, total change in demand deposits, total change in checkable deposits, total change in the banking system. All the same exact idea. It's just the question of how much money in total went through the bank because I deposited $5,000. And the answer in that case will always be DD plus NDD, or $25,000. My initial deposit put money into the banking system. The 20000 put money into the banking system as it went from bank to bank to bank to bank. And finally, if it asks for the maximum potential change in loans, that is just NDD, which we already said was 20000 So that's a demand deposit problem and the most common. But public bonds are also asked a lot about on the AP exam as well, so we need to go over those. So public bonds are the same that we are just going over with monetary policy as open market operations and government securities. Bonds from the Federal Reserve to the government. So open, public, and government are great keywords to let you know this is a public bond. And that'll be very significant when we compare it to private bonds. So we assume that the money from the public bond ends up in the banking system just like a demand deposit. So if the Federal Reserve buys $5 million in government securities, that $5 million will end up in the demand deposits for a bank. And then it'll go through the same exact process. So this bank has to keep $1 million in required reserves, 20%, which leaves $4 million to loan out. If I times that by the money multiplier of 5, that puts $20 million in my new demand deposits. So questions on the AP exam about a public bond. The most important question is what happens initially to the money supply because public bonds are the only ones that do this. When the Fed buys a bond from the government, they are putting money into the government's hands that did not exist before, brand new money. So instantly, when the Fed buys a bond from the government, it increases the money supply by the amount of that bond. So in this case, the money supply would instantly increase by $5 million. It's the only type of problem that instantly changes the money supply. The next question is the same as the demand deposit. How much could this bank initially lend out? $4 million. Then this question ends up having a different answer than the demand deposit problem. How much could the money supply potentially change by? Well, we said the $5 million instantly changed the money supply. But then also, 20 million was created through the money multiplier effect. So the maximum potential change in the money supply for a public bond will be $25 million, DD plus NDD, versus demand deposits where just NDD created new money. And the final question ends up being the same answer as how much money was created, how much money in total went through the banking system. Also, 25 million, five from the initial deposit and 20 as it went from bank to bank to bank to bank. And then finally, we have private bond problems. Private bonds are a very different concept from public bonds. Whereas public bonds are from the Fed to the government, private bonds are bonds from the Federal Reserve to banks. Or you may just see it as between banks, bank to bank, bank to bank bonds. And what's different about these is these are bonds that already existed in a bank's excess reserves. So it was already there before, just unused. So when the Fed buys a bond from a bank, it's saying, hey, you know that money in your excess reserves? You can now use it and put it into the economy. So this means nothing initially happens to demand deposits in a private bond. And they don't have to take out required reserves because it was money already in excess reserves, which the whole amount of the bond will end up starting in the excess reserves. So public bonds start in DD, Private bonds start in ER. And then you times it by the money multiplier, just like the other two. And then your NDD would be the full 25 for the private bond. So AP questions on a private bond problem. First off, 
that money already existed in a bank's excess reserve. So when it asked if the money supply immediately changed, you would say no, that money was already in existence in the money supply before. Second question, when it asked how much can this bank initially lend out, it would be the full five, because again, they didn't have to take out the required reserves because it was already in a bank's excess reserves. Next question is the same as a public bond. What's the maximum potential change in the money supply? 25 was created through the money multiplier, so the money supply could potentially increase by 25 million. How much in total went through the banking system is also the same as a public bond. It's just the 25 million that was created through the money multiplier. But one difference between a private bond and the other two is the maximum change in loans. So a maximum change in loans is always just NDD because that's loans that go from bank to bank to bank. So in the case of the demand deposit in the public bond, the maximum change in loans was just the 20 or the 20,000. But in the private bond, the entire amount of it, the 25, went through loans. So the maximum change in loans for a private bond would be the full 25 million. So these are the three types of problems you will see on the AP exam when it's a money multiplier problem. It may give it to you where it just says this person deposits or this public bond or this private bond, or it may give you a bank's T-chart and you have to use the information from these charts in terms of an entire bank's T-chart. As long as you follow these rules that I have just gone through and these concepts with demand deposits, public bonds, and private bonds, you will still be able to get the correct answer. And this is the review for the money multiplier.